Disc Hero 1, The Color of Magic By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 2x9 Since you are a wizard of sorts, you are of course aware that we live upon live upon a world shaped, as it were, like a disc. And that there is said to exist, towards the far rim, a continent which though small is equal in weight to all the mighty land masses in this hemicircle? And that this, according to ancient legend, is because it is largely made of gold. Rinswind nodded. Who hadn't heard of the counterweight continent? Some sailors even believed the childhood tales and sailed in search of it. Of course, they returned either empty-handed or not at all. Probably eaten by giant turtles, in the opinion of more serious mariners. Because, of course, the counterweight continent was nothing more than a solar myth. It does, of course, exist, said the patrician. Although it is not made of gold, it is true that gold is a very common metal there. Most of the mass is made up by vast deposits of octiron deep within the crust. Now it I see, said the patrician sweetly. You feel, perhaps, that it would be a marvelous thing to go to the counterweight continent and bring back a shipload of gold. Rinswind had a feeling that some sort of trap was being set. Yes. He ventured. And if every man on the shores of the Circle Sea had a mountain of gold of his own? Would that be a good thing? What would happen? Think carefully. Rinswind's brow furrowed. He thought. We'd all be rich. The way the temperature fell at his remark told him that it was not the correct one. I may as well tell you, Rinswind, that there is some contact between the lords of the Circle Sea and the Emperor of the Agaten Empire, as it is styled, the patrician went on. It is only very slight there is little common ground between us. We have nothing they want, and they have nothing we can afford. It is an old empire, Rinswind. Old and cunning however. He landed this morning. He might have met a great hero, or the cunningest of thieves, or some wise and great sage. He met you. He has employed you as a guide. You will be a guide, Rinswind, to this looker, this to a flower. You will see that he returns home with a good report of our little homeland. What do you say to that? E.R. Thank you, Lord, said Rinswind miserably. There is another point, of course. It would be a tragedy should anything untoward happen to our little visitor. It would be dreadful if he were to die, for example. Dreadful for the whole of our land, because the Agaten Emperor looks after his own and could certainly extinguish us at a nod. A mere nod. And that would be dreadful for you, Rinswind, because in the weeks that remained before the Empire's huge mercenary fleet arrived certain of my servants would occupy themselves about your person in the hope that the avenging captains, on their arrival, might find their anger tempered by the sight of your still living body. There are certain spells that can prevent the life departing from a body be it never so abused, the privacy of his own skull. Capital. I gather already that you and Tu Flower are on the best of terms. An excellent beginning when he returns safely to his homeland you will not find me ungrateful. I shall probably even dismiss the charges against you. Thank you, Rinswind. You may go. Rinswind decided not to ask for the return of his five remaining Rinu. He backed away, cautiously. Oh, and there is one other thing the patrician said, as the wizard groped for the door handles. Yes, Lord. He replied, with a sinking heart. I am sure you won't dream of trying to escape from your obligations by fleeing the city. I judge you to be a born city person. But you may be sure that the lords of the other cities will be appraised of these conditions by nightfall. I assure you the thought never even crossed my mind, Lord. Indeed? Then if I were you I'd sue my face for slander. The dark interior of the drum was a broil of fighting men, 
quite a number of them. A third and longer glance confirmed. In bits. Rinswine swayed back as a wildly thrown stool sailed past and smashed on the far side of the street. Then he dived in. He was wearing a dark robe, made darker by constant wear and irregular washings. In the raging gloom no one appeared to notice a shadowy shape that shuffled desperately from table to table. At one point a fighter, staggering back, trod on what felt like fingers. A number of what felt like teeth bit his ankle. He yelped shrilly and dropped his guard just sufficiently for a sword, swung by a surprised opponent, to skewer him. Rinswind reached the stairway, sucking his bruised hand and running with a curious, bent over gait. A crossbow quarrel thunked into the banister rail above him, and he gave a whimper. He made the stairs in one breathless rush, expecting at any moment another more accurate shot. Hurled it. Rinswine ducked. There was a brief scream behind him as the crossbow man, sighting down his weapon, dropped it and clutched at his throat. The big man was already reaching for another knife. Rinswine looked around wildly, and then with wild improvisation drew himself up into a wizardly pose. His hand was flung back. A sonatai. Pure Ruchel Bezel Blear. The man hesitated, his eyes flicking nervously from side to side as he waited for the magic. The conclusion that there was not going to be any hit him at the same time as Rinswind, whirring wildly down the passage, kicked him sharply in the groin. As he screamed and clutched at himself the wizard dragged open the door, sprang inside, slammed it behind him and threw his body against it, panting. It was quiet in here. There was to flower, sleeping peacefully on the bed. And there, at the foot of the bed, was the luggage. Rinswine took a few steps forward, cupidity moving him as easily as if Rinswine looked at his fingers, and then at the lid. It looked heavy, and was bound with brass bands. It was quite still now. What wind? Rinswine. To flower sprang off the bed. The wizard jumped back, wrenching his features into a smile. My dear chap, right on time. We'll just have lunch, and then I am sure UVE got a wonderful program lined up for this afternoon. That's great, Rinswine took a deep breath. Look, he said desperately, let's eat somewhere else. There's been a bit of a fight down below. A tavern brawl? Why didn't you wake me up? Well, you see, I... What? I thought I made myself clear this morning, Rinswind. I want to see genuine Morpork in life the slave market, the whore pits, the temple of small gods, the beggar's guild. And a genuine tavern brawl. A faint yes. What's wrong with that? For a start, People get hurt. Oh, I wasn't suggesting we get involved. I just want to see one, that's all. And some of your famous heroes. You do have some, don't you? It's not all dockside talk. And now, to the wizard's astonishment, to Flower was almost pleading. Oh, yeah. We have them all right, said Rinswind hurriedly. He pictured them in his mind, and recoiled from the thought. All the heroes of the Circle Sea passed through the gates of Ankh Morpork sooner or later. Most of them were from the barbaric tribes near the Frozen Hub, which had a sort of export trade in heroes almost all of them had crude magic swords, whose unsuppressed harmonics on the astral plane played hell with any delicate experiments in applied sorcery for miles around, but Rinswind didn't object to them on that score. He knew himself to be a magical dropout, so it didn't bother him that the mere Ising Aroda. He rubbed his nose. The only heroes he had much time for were Bravd and the Weasel, who were out of town at the moment, and Hrun the Barbarian, who was practically an academic by hub standards in that he could think without moving his lips. Hrun was said to be roving somewhere turnwise. Look, he said at last. 
Have you ever met a barbarian? To Flower shook his head. I was afraid of that, said Rinswind. Well. Theory there was a clatter of running feet in the street outside and a fresh uproar from downstairs. It was followed by a commotion on the stairs. The door was flung open before Rinswind could collect himself sufficiently to make a dash for the window. But instead of the greed crazed madman he expected, he found himself looking into the round red face of a sergeant of the watch. He breathed again. Of course. The watch were always careful not to intervene too soon in any brawl where the odds were not heavily ignored him. This the foreigner? He inquired. We were just leaving, said Rinswind quickly, and switched to Traub. To Flower, I think we ought to get lunch somewhere else. I know some places. He marched out into the corridor with as much aplomb as he could muster. To Flower followed, and a few seconds later there was a strangling sound from the sergeant as the luggage closed its lid with a snap, stood up, stretched, and marched after them. Watchmen were dragging bodies out of the room downstairs. There were no survivors. The watch had ensured this by giving them ample time to escape via the back door, a neat compromise between caution and justice that benefited all parties. Who are all these men? said to Flower. Oh, you know. Just men, said Rinswind. And before he could stop himself some part of his brain that had nothing to do took control of his mouth and added, Heroes, in fact. Zanel is run the barbarian here. Said to Flower, looking around eagerly. Rinswind took a deep breath. That's him behind us, he said. The enormity of this lie was so great that its ripples did in fact spread out one of the lower astral planes as far as the magical quarter across the river, where it picked up tremendous velocity from the huge standing wave of power that always hovered there and bounced wildly across the circle sea. A harmonic got as far as Hrun himself, currently fighting a couple of gnolls on a crumbling ledge high in the Cadrac Mountains, and caused him a moment's unexplained discomfort. To Flower, meanwhile, had thrown back the lid of the luggage and was hastily pulling out a heavy black cube. This is fantastic, he said. They're never going to believe this at home. What's he going on about? said the sergeant doubtfully. Them all to stand over by the window, please? This won't take a moment. And, E.R., Rinswind? Yes. To Flower stood on tiptoe to whisper. I expect you know what this is, don't you? Rinswine stared down at the box. It had a round glass eye protruding from the center of one face, and a lever at the back. Not wholly, he said. It's a device for making pictures quickly, said To Flower. Quite a new invention. I am rather proud of it but, look. I don't think these gentlemen would. Well, I mean they might be. Sort of apprehensive? Could you explain it to them? I'll reimburse them for their time, of course. He's got a box with a demon in it that draws pictures, said Rinswind shortly. Do what the madman says and he will give you gold. The watch smiled nervously. High above the disc the second albatross soared so high in fact that its tiny mad orange eyes could see the whole of the world and the great, glittering, girdling circle sea. There was a yellow message capsule strapped to one leg. Far below it, unseen in the clouds, the bird that had brought the earlier message to the patrician of Ankh-Morpork flapped gently back to its home. Rinswind looked at the tiny square of glass in astonishment. There he was, all right. A tiny figure, in perfect color, standing in front of a group of watchmen whose faces were each frozen in a terrified rictus. A buzz of wordless terror went up from the men around him as they craned over his shoulder to look. Grinning, to flower produced a handful of the smaller coins Rinswind now recognized as Quarter Rinu. He winked at the wizard. 
I had similar problems when I stopped over in the Brown Islands, he said. They thought the iconograph steals a bit of their souls. Laughable, isn't it? The coins quietened the men's agitation in the way that gold can, and Rinswind was amazed to find, half a minute later, that he was holding a little glass portrait of Tuflower wielding a huge notched sword and smiling as though all his dreams had come true. They lunched at a small eating house near the brass bridge, with the luggage nestling under the table. The food and wine, both far superior to Rinswine's normal fare, did much to relax him. Things weren't going to be too bad, he decided. A bit of invention and some quick thinking that was all that was needed. To Flower seemed to be thinking too. Looking reflectively into his wine cup he said, Tavern fights are pretty common around here, I expect. Oh, fairly. No doubt fixtures and fittings get damaged. Fixed. Oh, I see. You mean like benches and whatnot? Yes, I suppose so. That must be upsetting for the innkeepers. You did say you wanted to try some typical Morporkean food, said Rinswind. What was that about risks? Oh, I know all about risks. They're my business. I thought that's what you said. I didn't believe it the first time either. Oh, I don't take risks. About the most exciting thing that happened to me was knocking some ink over. I assess risks. Day after day. Do you know what the odds are against a house catching fire in the Red Triangle district of De Pelargic? 538 to 1. I calculated that, he added with a trace of pride. What Rinswine tried to suppress a burp what for? Excuse me. He helped himself to some more wine for two flower paused. I can't say it in Traub. I don't think the Betrobi have a word for it. In our language we call it he said a collection of outlandish syllables. In sewer ants, repeated Rinswind. That's a funny word. Vos it mean? Well suppose you have a ship loaded with, say, gold bars. It might run then, if the cargo is lost, I reimburse you. Rebers. Pay you the value of your cargo, said to Flower patiently. Oh I get it. It's like a bet, right? A wager? In a way, I suppose. And you make money at this in sewer ants. It offers a return on investment, certainly. Wrapped in the warm yellow glow of the wine, Rinswine tried to think of in sewer ants in circle C terms. I don't think I understand this in sewer ants, he said firmly, idly watching the world spin by, magic now. Magic I understand. To flower grinned. Magic is one thing, and reflected sound of underground spirits is another, he said. Way. What? That funny word you used, said Rinswind impatiently. Round his neck. Rinswine trailed behind, whimpering at intervals and checking to see that his head was still there. A few others followed, too. In a city where public executions, duels, fights, magical feuds and strange events regularly punctuated the daily round the inhabitants had brought the profession of interested bystander to a peak of perfection. They were, to a man, highly skilled yawpers. In any case, to Flower was delightedly taking picture after picture of people engaged in what he described as typical activities, and since a quarter Rinu would subsequently change hands for their trouble a tale of bemused and happy Nuvariches was soon following him in case this madman exploded in a shower of gold. At the temple of the seven-handed Sek a hasty convocation of priests and ritual heart transplant artisans agreed that the hundred-span high statue of Sek was altogether too holy to be made into a magic picture, but a payment of two Rinu left them astoundedly agreeing that perhaps he wasn't as holy as all that. That froze the light, that passed through them. Or something like that, anyway. 
Rinswind often suspected that there was something, somewhere, that was better than magic. He was usually disappointed. However, he soon took every opportunity to operate the box. Tuflower was only too pleased to allow this, since that enabled the little man to appear in his own pictures. It was at this point that Rinswind noticed something strange. Possession of the box conferred a kind of power on the wielder which was that anyone, confronted with the hypnotic glass eye, would submissively obey the most peremptory orders about stance and expression. It was while he was thus engaged in the plaza of broken moons that disaster struck. Tuflower had posed alongside a bewildered charm seller, his crowd of newfound admirers watching him with interest in case he did something humorously lunatic. Rinswind got down on one knee, the better to arrange the picture, and pressed the enchanted lever. Took all those pictures of young ladies, should you? It's monochrome from now on, friend. All right. All right. Yeah, sure, said Rinswind. In one dim corner of the little box he thought he could see an easel, and a tiny unmade bed. He hoped he couldn't. So long as that's understood, said the imp, and shut the door. Rinswine thought he could hear the muffled sound of grumbling and the scrape of a stool being dragged across the floor. To flower he began, and looked up. To flower had vanished. As Rinswine stared at the crowd, with sensations of prickly horror traveling up his spine, there came a gentle prod in the small of his back. Turn without haste said a voice like black silk. Or kiss your kidneys goodbye. The crowd watched with interest. It was turning out to be quite a good day. At the bags of gold. Wythel smiled. It made an unnerving effect on his scar-crossed face. I know you, he said. A gutter wizard. What is that thing? Rinswind became aware that the lid of the luggage was trembling slightly although there was no wind. And he was still holding the picture box. This? It makes pictures, he said brightly. Hey! Just hold that smile, will you? He backed away quickly and pointed the box. For a moment Wythel hesitated. What? He said. That's fine, hold it just like that. Said Rinswind. The thief paused, then growled and swung his sword back. There was a snap, and a duet of horrible screams Rinswine did not glance around for fear of the terrible things he might see, and by the time Wythel looked for him again he was on the other side of the plaza and still accelerating. The albatross descended in wide, slow sweeps that ended in an undignified carelessness brought on by surprise. Sucking at the nasty beak wound on the back of his hand Rinswind pounded down an alley, paying no heed to the screams of rage coming from the picture box and cleared a high wall with his frayed robe flapping around him like the feathers of a disheveled jackdaw. He landed in the forecourt of a carpet shop, scattering the merchandise and customers dived through its rear exit trailing apologies skidded down another alley and stopped, teetering dangerously just as he was about to plunge unthinkingly into the ank. There are said to be some mystic rivers one drop of which can steal a man's life away. After its turbid passage through the Twin Cities the ank could have been one of them. In the distance the cries of rage took on a shrill note of terror. Rinswind looked around desperately for a boat, or a handhold up the sheer walls on either side of him. He was trapped. Unbidden the spell welled up in his mind. It was perhaps untrue to say medicine had been unable to coax it. Precisely which one it was they were also unable to ascertain, except that it was one of the eight basic spells that were intricately interwoven with the very fabric of time and space itself. Since then it had been showing a worrying tendency, when Rinswind was feeling run down or especially threatened, to try to get itself said. He clenched his teeth together but the first syllable forced itself around the corner of his mouth. His left hand raised involuntarily and, as the magical force whirled him round, began to give off octarine sparks. 
the luggage hurtled around the corner, its several hundred knees moving like pistons. Rin Swind gaped. The spell died, unsaid. The box didn't appear to be hampered in any way by the ornamental rug draped roguishly over it, nor by the thief hanging by one arm from the lid. It was in a very real sense, a dead weight. Further along the lid were the remains of two fingers, owner unknown. Presumably the box had to have a master. In the absence of Tu Flower, had it adopted him? The tide was turning and he could see debris drifting downstream in the yellow afternoon light towards the river gate, a mere hundred yards downstream. It was the work of a moment to let the dead thief join them. Even if it was found later it would hardly cause comment. And the sharks in the ank were used to solid, regular meals. Rinswind watched the body drift away, and considered his next move. The luggage would probably float. All he had to do was wait until dusk, and then go out with the tide. There were plenty of wild places downstream where he could wait ashore, and then... Well, if the patrician really had sent out word about him then a change of clothing and a shave should take care of that. In any case, there were other lands and he had a facility for languages. Let him but get to Chimera or Ghanim or Ekelpon and half a dozen armies couldn't bring him back. And then? Wealth, comfort, security. Ah, Gorful, said the patrician pleasantly. Come in. Sit down. Can I press you to a candied starfish? I am yours to command, master, said the old man calmly. Save, perhaps, in the matter of preserved echinoderms. The patrician shrugged and indicated the scroll on the table. Read that, he said. Gorful picked up the parchment and raised one eyebrow slightly when he saw the familiar ideograms of the Golden Empire. He read in silence for perhaps a minute, and then turned the scroll over to examine minutely the seal on the obverse. You are famed as a student of Empire affairs, said the patrician. Can you explain this? Knowledge in the matter of the empire lies less in noting particular events than in studying a certain cast of mind, said the old diplomat. The message is curious, yes, but not surprising. This morning the emperor instructed, the patrician allowed himself the in the service of several emperors. He regards them as a necessary but tiresome ingredient in the successful running of the empire. He does not like things out of place. The empire was not built by allowing things to get out of place. That is his view. I begin to see, said the patrician. Quite so. Gorful smiled into his beard. This tourist is a thing that is out of place. After acceding to his master's wishes nine turning mirrors would, I am quite sure, make his own arrangements with a view to ensuring that one wanderer would not be allowed to return home bringing, perhaps, the disease of dissatisfaction. The empire likes people to stay where it puts them. So much more convenient, then, if this two flower disappears for good in the barbarian lands. Meaning here, master. And your advice? Said the patrician. Gorful shrugged. Merely that you should do nothing. Matters will undoubtedly resolve quite so, master. The patrician nodded. It was all rather a relief. He agreed with nine turning mirrors. Life was difficult enough, people ought to stay where they were put. Brilliant constellations shone down on the disc world. One by one the traders shuttered their shops. One by one the gonafs, thieves, fine wirers, whores, illusionists, backsliders and second story men awoke and breakfasted. Wizards went about their polydimensional affairs. Tonight saw the conjunction of two powerful planets, and already the air over the magical quarter was hazy with early spells. Look, said Rinswind, this isn't getting us anywhere. He inched sideways. The luggage followed faithfully, lid half open and menacing. Rinswind briefly considered making a desperate leap to safety. 
the lid smacked in anticipation. In any case, he told himself with sinking heart, the damn thing would only follow him again. It had that dogged look about it. Even if he managed to get to a horse, he had a nasty suspicion that the box moved forward slightly. Now there was just a narrow strip of greasy jetty between Rinswine's heels and the river. A flash of precognition told him that the box would be able to swim faster than he could. He tried not to imagine what it would be like to drown in the ank. It won't stop until you give in, you know, said a small voice conversationally. Rinswine looked down at the iconograph, still hanging around his neck. Its trap door was open and the homunculus was leaning against the trap, smoking a pipe and watching the proceedings with amusement. I'll take you in with me, at least, said Rinswine through gritted teeth. The imp took the pipe out of his mouth. What did you say? He said. I said I'll take you in with me, damn it. Suit yourself. The imp tapped the side of the box meaningfully. We'll see who sinks first. The luggage yawned, and moved forward a fraction of an inch. You're a wizard, said the picture imp. You'll think of some way to find him. Not much of a wizard, I am afraid. You can just jump down on everyone and turn them into worms, the imp added encouragingly, ignoring his last remark. No. Turning to animals is an eighth-level spell. I never even completed my training. I only know one spell. Well, that'll do. I doubt it, said Rinswind hopelessly. What does it do, then? Can't tell you. Don't really want to talk about it. But frankly, he sighed, no spells are much good. It takes three months to commit even a simple one to memory, and then once UVE used it, pow it's gone. That's what's so stupid about the whole magic thing, you know. You spend twenty years learning the spell that makes nude virgins appear in your bedroom, and then you're so poisoned by quicksilver fumes and half-blind well, if you must know, I thought he didn't mean magic. Not as such. What else is there, then? Rinswind began to feel really wretched. I don't know, he said. A better way of doing things, I suppose. Something with a bit of sense in it. Harnessing. Harnessing the lightning, or something. The imp gave him a kind but pitying look. Lightning is the spears hurled by the thunder giants when they fight, it said gently, established meteorological fact. You can't harness it. I know, said Rinswind miserably. That's the flaw in the argument, of course. The imp nodded. And disappeared into the depths of the iconograph. A few moments later Rinswind smelled bacon frying. He waited until his stomach couldn't stand the strain any more, and rapped on the box. The imp reappeared. I've been thinking about what you said, it said even before Rinswine's stomach. Eat something, then. That's logic. How? Every time I move that damn box flexes its hinges at me. The luggage, on cue, gaped widely. See. It's not trying to bite you, said the imp. There's food in there. You're no use to it starved. Rinswind peered into the dark recesses of the luggage. There were indeed, among the chaos of boxes and bags of gold, several bottles and packages in oiled paper. He gave a cynical laugh, mooched around the abandoned jetty until he found a piece of wood about the right length wedged it as politely as possible in the gap between the lid and the box, and pulled out one of the flat packages. It held biscuits that turned out to be as hard as diamond wood. Bloody hell, he muttered, nursing his teeth. Captain Eight Panthers Travelers digestives them, said the imp from the doorway to his box, saved many a life at sea, they have. Trust. Yes. That's what he didn't, the water here. See? Rinswind opened a bottle. 
the liquid inside might have been water. It had a flat, empty flavor, with no trace of life. Neither taste nor smell. He grumbled the luggage gave a little creak, attracting his attention. With a lazy air of calculated menace it shut its lid slowly, grinding Rinswine's impromptu wedge like a dry loaf. All right, all right, he said. I am thinking. Emer's headquarters were in the leaning tower at the junction of Rime Street and Frost Alley. At midnight the solitary guard leaning in the shadows looked up at the conjoining planets and wondered idly what change in his fortunes they might herald. There was the faintest of sounds, as of a gnat yawning. The guard glanced down the deserted street, and now caught the glimmer of moonlight on something lying in the mud a few yards away. He picked it up. The lunar light gleamed on gold, and his intake of breath was almost true, that something as heavy as gold could fall naturally from the sky. As he drew level with the opposite alley mouth some more fell. It was still in its bag, there was an awful lot of it, and Rinswind brought it down heavily onto his head. When the guard came to he found himself looking up into the wild-eyed face of a wizard, who was menacing his throat with a sword. In the darkness too, something was gripping his leg. It was the disconcerting sort of grip that suggested that the gripper could grip a whole lot harder, if he wanted to. Where is he, the rich foreigner? hissed the wizard. Quickly. What's holding my leg? said the man, with a note of terror in his voice. He tried to wriggle free. The pressure increased you wouldn't want to know, said Rinswind pay attention, please. Where's the foreigner? Not here. They ve got him at Broadman's place. Out of the dark and plunged off after the wizard. Something with hundreds of tiny feet. With only his homemade phrase book to help him to flower was trying to explain the mysteries of in sour ants to Broadman. The fat innkeeper was listening intently, his little black eyes glittering. From the other end of the table Emer watched with mild amusement, occasionally feeding one of his ravens with scraps from his plate. Beside him Wythel paced up and down. You fret too much, said Emer, without taking his eyes from the two men opposite him. I can feel it strain. Who would dare attack us here? And the gutter wizard will come. He's too much of a coward not to. And he'll try to bargain. And we shall have him. And the gold. And the chest. Wythel's one eye glared, and he made a fist into the palm of a black-gloved hand. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.